Let's see if we can draw the mechanism for this reaction. Ultimately, that's going to be what's happening. That's right. This is a reaction where we definitely need to know the full mechanism, however. So let's go through that. Now, is there anybody around who would be reasonable to put at the tail of an electron pushing arrow? For pi bonds. Because we've just memorized that carbon carbon pi bonds are good to put at tails of electron pushing arrows. And let's put this boron at the head. Now, why is it reasonable for the boron to be at the head of the arrow? Well, based on what we've learned previously, it's not reasonable. We haven't learned any reason why we put the boron at the head here, because for one thing, the boron doesn't have any charges. It doesn't even have a delta charge because it's, it's bonded to something of the same electronegativity. Aren't you trying to get rid of it? Get rid of the boron? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, did I misspeak? I should have said the bromine. I should have said we want to know why we're... Like the leaving group. Like, usually yeah. they're trying to like, get rid of it via substitution. So the bromine, we know that the bromine can often be a good leaving group. That's right. But here we're treating the bromine as an electrophile. Here we're treating the bromine as an electrophile. We haven't seen any other reactions where we're just using a neutral bromine as an electrophile. Well, probably the best thing to do is just to memorize that uh, that diatomic halogens are electrophilic with carbon-carbon pi bonds. We should probably just memorize that diatomic halogens are electrophilic with carbon-carbon pi bonds. This doesn't really, it's not what we, would, what, we, what we would have predicted based on any of our previous rules, so we'll just memorize that this happens. Most of the electron pushing arrows, we try to show why they're reasonable based on charges, but this we're basically just going to memorize. There is a kind of explanation that the textbooks use. They say something like how, well, there's a temporary dipole. They say there's a temporary dipole where even though there's no permanent charge here, maybe temporarily, this could be delta positive. That's not a very satisfying explanation because then you could say that anything could have a temporary dipole. So, for the most part, we're just going to memorize that this is a reaction that happens even though we might not have predicted it previously. Something else we need to memorize is that at the same time as this boron is being attacked by the pi bond, it's going to take one of its lone pairs and attack the other carbon. And at the same time as that is happening, the other bromine is going to leave. This is all stuff that we might not have predicted, so we just basically have to memorize this. So taking one of its lone pairs... To attack... While one of the alkene carbons is attacking the bromine, the bromine is simultaneously using one of its lone pairs to attack the other alkene carbon. this bromine has to leave. That makes sense, because we know the bromines are good leaving groups. But for the most part, we just have to memorize this. Although this should remind you a little bit of that boron reaction we just saw, where at the, at the same time that the boron was getting attacked, it was also donating a hydrogen to the other <coughs> alkene carbon. Well, at the same time that this bromine is getting attacked, it's also donating a lone pair to this other alkene. But for the most part, we're just going to memorize this. And also, we've learned that maybe the best way to write reactions like this with non-cyclic alkenes With a non-cyclic alkene, it's actually best to draw the alkene on its side, so to speak, with the substituents pointing into the page and out of the page, because that way you can show the electrophile coming in from above or coming in from below.
Now let's see if we can draw what the product would be from this step. Take your time. Remember that the arrows really tell us exactly what the product should look like. That's right, yeah. So that's a cycle. Yeah, good. Okay, that's better. I said that the arrows, if we take our time, will tell us exactly what the product is, but you really have to take your time here. This is not, again, this is not something necessarily that we've seen before. is happening, where are the electrons coming from that this arrow represents? And where are they going to? Are they going to a bond or to a lone pair? A bond. Yeah, a bond between what two things? The carbon and the bromine. Right. So here's where those electrons have ended up. Now because we've shown the bromine coming in from above, that would push the methyl and the hydrogen here down below. So we should push the methyl and the hidden hydrogen down below. Maybe I should also draw in the hidden hydrogens here. So they both got pushed below, but the hydrogen is still on the dash and the methyl is still on a wedge. There's no reason why those should have flipped. Now this is the tricky arrow, although you eventually figured it out, so that was good. Where are the electrons coming from that this arrow represents? A, a bond or a lone pair. The lone pair on the bromine. And where are they going to, a bond or a lone pair? That's what you eventually figured out. One way to see that is you can never take a lone pair and make it into another lone pair. You never do a lone pair to lone pair transition. We never do a lone pair to lone pair transition. So this must be forming a bond. A bond between what two atoms? So this lone pair ended up over here. Again, we're not going to get this if we just draw something that feels good or that looks like what we've seen in the past. We just have to do what the arrows are telling us to do. The arrows are telling us to form a bond between the bromine and this carbon, even if it doesn't feel good, even if that's not what we are used to seeing in the past. Now, this bromine is also attacking from above on the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. So the methyl group and the hydrogen will get pushed down. Here's where it's helpful to have drawn the alkene on its side like this, with the wedges and dashes. Well, again, when we, when we have a non-cyclic alkene, uh, alkene getting attacked, very often it's most useful to draw it like this, with the wedges and the dashes, so we can show the stereochemistry here. Uh, then you showed the bromine leaving. Ah, now, the charges here are really quite tricky, because, first of all, who's at the final head? Yeah, so clearly that should be negative. The reason this is tricky is there is no initial tail. There's no initial tail because these arrows kind of form a cycle. Mm -hmm. These arrows form a cycle, so there is no initial tail. No, what I said was wrong. Let's try again. So if this gained a negative charge, somebody has to gain a positive charge. But it's a little difficult to figure out. Is it because the bromine's losing the electron pair or sharing right. it? Right. So then it becomes sort of positive. Which bromine becomes positive? That's one. Yeah. It's, um, now, this is where we can't just rely on the initial tail. It's a little hard to see the initial tail here, but how many arrows are pointing towards this bromine? How many arrows are pointing towards this bromine? One. And how many are pointing? Away, so yeah, and that's the reason why it ends up with a full positive charge. Can you put that there? And we definitely need to put that there. Remember, the charges are the most important part of the whole picture. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Here, there, in a sense, there isn't an initial tail, but we, can, uh, we know there has to be a positive charge to balance this negative charge. Well, this bromine has one arrow coming towards it and two arrows away, so it's the one that's going to have to get that positive charge. Yeah. So this is called a cyclic bromonium ion. Cyclic bromonium. It's clear why it's called cyclic. And odium is the suffix we use when things have charges. You're already familiar, I think, with, say, hydronium, mm -hmm. which is a water with a positive charge. Well, here we have bromonium, a bromine with a positive charge. 